Well, I want to welcome everyone once more to our lecture series, Institute Encounters. Um, we have a very interesting guest today, uh, Dr. Victoria Tinbor Huey, uh, who is an associate professor of political science at Notre Dame University and the author of a very, very interesting book comparing aspects of Chinese and Western civilization, which is one of the things we like to do, uh, called War and State Formation in Early in Chi China. In China and Early Modern Europe. Uh, and uh, she will be lecturing uh, this evening uh, on the topic of beyond Sinocentrism and Eurocentrism. So that's going to be fascinating as well. Uh, I, I wanted to kind of take up some, some questions that you're very interested in and knowledgeable about, but you won't be addressing uh, this evening. And uh, you're, a, you're a Hong Kong native um, with close ties to Hong Kong continuing uh, to this day. Um, and of course, uh, Hong Kong has always been an interesting place, but it's an unusually interesting place now. Uh, because it's sort of a, a, a crucible of, of potential democracy uh, in China. Uh, and uh, recently there was a kind of wave of protests called the Umbrella Movement, um, which was aimed at bringing true democracy to a country that's, to a city that's been promised it, uh, but hasn't really realized it. Could you just, for the sake of our viewers, give a little bit of the background to the Umbrella Movement and what it represents? Yeah, thank you so much for um, being interested in Hong Kong. Actually, Hong Kong people are very grateful of that. The other day when Kamen, when he in, in his uh, acceptance speech for the Oscars award, and he mentioned Hong Kong, Hong Kong people were just ecstatic. <laughs> yes, because it, it, for some reason, actually, Taiwanese, um, ta Taiwanese protesters always ask why is it that the world pays so much attention to Hong Kong and nobody cares about what is going on in Taiwan. But in any case, um, Hong Kong people want the, the slogan, the main slogan is we want genuine universal suffrage because Hong Kong does have partial, democ partial democracy. The Legislative Council is, part is partially elected by uh, direct elections through geographical constituencies. What is at stake now is that the chief executive, according to Beijing's own decision, is supposed to be returned by universal suffrage in 2017. But then last year, Beijing issued this decision that yes, you guys can have one person, one vote, but the candidates will be screened by something called the, the nominating committee. Only two to three candidates could be screened, could be allowed to actually run in this election uh, for one, one person, one vote. And Hong Kong people did not like that. And before the, the, MPC, the um, uh, national government's decision was announced on August 31st last year, there had been actually this mobilization that, you know, actually we, Hong Kong people were promised genuine universal suffrage democracy for a long time. And it is Beijing that actually promised us that this is going to finally happen in 2017. So people had mobilized before that, that um, if you don't really deliver the promise, we will start to occupy Hong Kong's central business district. It's like occupying Wall Street to disrupt businesses to, in order to compel the governments to do something. So when the governments then came down with the decision that, you know, this is not, well, you have one person, one vote, but we'll choose the candidates, the same candidates. And people got really upset and started, and, and of course it didn't help that the police was also, were also trying to really um, took a heavy hand in, in, in arresting and, and, and manhandling students. And so that starts, sparked the umbrella movement last year in September, late September. And it was designed to be non-violent protest. So there was a very clear idea in the minds of those who helped organize it, uh, that this was going to be in the tradition of, of, of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and other types of non-violent protests. Uh, which is a growing movement in the world today, and a self-conscious movement, I take it, and a movement that has its own organizations and educational centers and things like that. Um, there's an international organization uh, that helps those who are interested in nonviolent protest. So this, uh, did this come to Hong Kong, or was it sort of a, an improvised effort to be nonviolent that didn't take full advantage 
of the knowledge that has accumulated is how best to do this. Now, of course, Beijing said that whatever Hong Kong people are doing, they are just running dogs for American hegemony, uh, or the uh, or the, <laughs> the CIA or the NED. They've been saying that all along. This is there has to be some kind of foreign force behind this, and of course, the finger points to the United States. But in fact, when we see how the umbrella movement unfolded, more or less people were really improvising. Hmm. Now, protesters they were also saying that we look to Martin Luther King, we look to Gandhi. But I personally, because I I I have actually studied nonviolent struggles for quite a while. I really don't think Hong Kong people are very conscious of the entire program of nonviolent struggle in a way that probably it would have been helpful if um, Hong Kong protesters had actually become more conscious in it, borrowing knowledge from around the world. Mm -hmm. At the time, there was a BBC story that the reporter went to cover the Freedom Forum held in Oslo with all these activists gathering mm -hmm. from around the world. And then they connected that to the um, Occupy movement in Hong Kong. And the story claimed that the, the Freedom Forum or some kind of international conspiracy had trained over a thousand Hong Kong activists. And that was, it just really wasn't true because mm -hmm. Hong Kong people also, in a way that because protest, protesters are so aware of Beijing's nervousness about the so-called color revolutions, they almost like wanted to shut themselves off from the knowledge that's been building up from around the world. So the only thing they were doing was really just occupying the streets peacefully. And probably they could have done other things because there are actually many more methods in terms of nonviolent strategy. And then at the same time, nonviolence is really something almost the only way out for Hong Kong. Hmm. Hong Kong people tend to be rather conservative in what they do. And in fact, the Occupy movement was really quite controversial by Hong Kong standard because for a long time people, people wanted democracy, but they would protest for one day or one afternoon or one evening and then they go home and everything and go back to school and go back to work. The Occupy movement was the first time ever that there was this kind of what we call disruptive action, mm -hmm. trying to basically occupy busy streets to disrupt what normal... What did they actually occupy? They were occupying... Um, the original plan of the Occupy movement was to occupy the central business district, which, which we just call central. Mm -hmm. And then because what happened, what sparked the movement was the, the root the umbrella revolution was that some students, they were, they were protesting, they launched a week-long class boycott. At the end of that week, some young students, high school students, they were trying to climb over a fence. The, the area is called the Civic Square. Two years ago, students and parents successfully gathered there to stall the government from introducing something they call patriotic education, national education. Hong Kong people didn't want to be brainwashed. And 100,000 people gathered at that city square right outside the central government offices. Over the past summer, the government was worried that something like that will repeat because they knew that they were going to introduce this proposal for one person, one vote, but not really genuine universal suffrage. They fence off the city square. And young students at the end of the week long boycott trying to, try to climb over the fence and reclaim our city square. And the policemen handled them, arrested all the mm -hmm. young students. And then the next day, a lot of protesters show up to 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 um, to, to really demand that these students be released and also basically to show more support. Then the police um, oh, uh, to turn on fire, to tear gas, and that got me even more people to mm -hmm. be very upset, and more people poured to the street. And that was the beginning of the umbrella movement. And that sparked the umbrella movement. The, the term umbrella comes from. The term umbrella comes from again very often when 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 their names people didn't originally have the name. That name umbrella revolution really came from international re reporters. Oh. It's so because Hong Kong people, Hong Kong, it, now and then it rains. And you can never predict when it's going to rain, when it is not going to rain. So m many people will just carry a very light umbrella in a purse, in a backpack, in a briefcase. And they use the umbrella to, to, to protect themselves from the tear gas and the pepper spray. And so you have scenes of people holding up umbrellas. And so international reporters thought that's the umbrella revolution. So this does not seem to have succeeded. The government waited them out or, or uh, did, did it reply? Did it uh, be vi did it turn violent against them, or it simply just waited for them to 
kind of lose their enthusiasm for protesting? Well, the, the government both waited them out and at the same time also used actually quite a bit a bit of force. So after the use of tear gas and pepper spray, then that sparks the umbrella movement. And the governments then learned the hard lesson that, well, you know, sometimes the use of force actually fails to mm -hmm. send the people to go home. You actually drive more people to go to the street. A week later, they didn't know what to do. Now, in fact, if the government had done nothing after that day of using tear gas and pepper spray, probably people would, the next three or four days after, people actually were already going back to, to school and going back to work. And there weren't very many people outside the central government offices already. And then um, the Friday after, there were thugs attacking protesters in another site, Mount Cock, across the mm. Victoria Harbor. People got really upset, and so more people would go back to the occupied sites. And over time, then okay, the, the governments then learned the lesson that this is not going to work. So we, we the police, then they went back to the police station and tried to hide out. And then we sent out thugs so that you know you could de deny any responsibility. That didn't work either. That also backfired. So then the governments just, just really decided to wait them out. Mm -hmm. The government held, held a talk with students' representatives, but that didn't really turn out anything because the gap apparently, because the government said that, you know, whatever Beijing decided, uh, we can't change that. We have to work within that framework. The students, the protesters demanded that the entire process should be reopened. Um, so we have to go back to square one. We cannot accept this framework that you you screen only you allow only two or three candidates to run for office. What what do you think will happen next? Next, so then the um over time, then of course more and more people would go back to school and go back to work, and then the occupied sites had very few people. Um, it is actually almost surprising that the umbrella movement lasted for as long as three months, and it was really uh, the sites were fully clear only in early December. And now that people go back to work and go back to go back to school, what happens next is that people haven't really given up the hope to fight for a genuine universal suffrage. And we have a lot of these young people, they say that we are really fighting for our future. They, they say that the future has been taken from us because if we don't have any say in, in shaping what Hong Kong's future holds, it's like what, what, what does it mean for us to continue to live in Hong Kong? And also that for my generation, a lot of people, if they could afford, they would just then just emigrate. Mm -hmm. They would leave Hong Kong. But a lot of these young people really can't afford to leave, and Hong Kong is their home. So they're very determined to continue to fight. But the movement is now in limbo in the sense that there's really no very concrete, no concrete idea of where to go, what to do next to keep up with the pressure. Now, you think that there are things that they could have done that would have been more effective than what they did? They're just sort of congregating for a long period of time in some central area uh, is not the way to put most intelligently, at least, pressure on the government. Uh, what what are the what are the techniques that are being developed now that that are that are better, that more effective? Yeah, so this is why I mentioned earlier that I'm, I wish that these protesters had really learned lessons from other, other nonviolent movements from around the world. So whether we're talking about Gandhi's movement, Gandhi actually called for a national boycott of British imports. And he, Gandhi is also, he has one of the, his symbols is that you have this cotton spinning wheel. We make our own cotton. Don't buy from British imports. They kill our own industry. And then with the civil rights movement, yes, there were actually all kinds of, you know, uh, people, there, were, there was the freedom riders, there were all kinds of disruptive actions. But at the same time, there was also this idea of boycotting businesses and general boycotts. And also in South Africa as well. On the, on the one hand, there was the MK, the militant wing, that, or, that was actually organizing um, uh, attacks from, from overseas. But in townships, there were also economic boycotts. And so the white business leaders, they felt, because they felt that it hurt, so they felt compelled to then pressure their own governments, the, the apartheid regime. Okay, can you please stop, uh, start talking to the apartheid, the, the, to the um, ANC leaders? We want an end to this economic boycott. Hong Kong is an international city with all these international businesses. And Beijing actually also really can't rule directly. Beijing really rules Hong Kong through a lot of local business elites. And yet unless those business elites feel that their interests are hurt, 
there's very little chance that protesters can convince them that democracy is a good thing, that you should accept genuine universal suffrage. The only way in all these other cases that, that are successful is that business elites feel that the pockets are hurting. And so can you then really talk to the protesters and see what they want? Can we then meet them halfway? And this is a lesson that I think Hong Kong protesters have not learned. So the idea is for protest, for nonviolent protest, to be targeted uh, and to focus on the kind of vulnerable points. And they tend to be economic vulnerabilities. You boycott. Uh, you don't pay your taxes. Uh, you don't show up for work. Uh, those kinds of things. And those kinds of things, of course, require a good deal of sacrifice on the part of the people who are doing them. Um, so in order to make it work, I mean, out in the world right now, there's, there's all kinds of dissatisfaction with all sorts of things, and uh, there are all kinds of regimes that are repressive. Um, in some cases, people seem to resort to nonviolent protest. Uh, in some cases, they resort to violent protest. In some cases, they do both. Um, where is, is nonviolent protest likely to be most effective? Are there certain types of situations where nonviolence, as opposed to, to violence, to putting barricades up in the streets or you're, you know, taking to the hills and fighting guerrilla wars, where, where nonviolence recommends itself? I think we probably could all agree that it's better to be nonviolent than violent. But in terms of its likelihood of success, uh, what sort of situations is it most likely to be successful in as a political scientist? Yeah, we actually, um, we have colleagues who have actually done this kind of study. So Chen Webb and Stefan, for example, they have this book and articles talking, comparing actually relative success rates of violent and nonviolent movements. Now, no, move, no particular set of strategy is really foolproof in the sense that you do this and you guarantee success. It just doesn't happen that way. But what it is is that that's when nonviolent movements have a slightly higher chance of success, successful rate, now think about violent movements. Cuba, successful case. Vietnam, successful case. Afghanistan, sort of yes and no, with actually a massive injection of actually American arms, um, including the Stinger missiles, in order to get rid of the Soviet Union. There aren't actually too many successful cases of violent struggles. Nonviolent struggles we have seen. Well, of course, China, the communist takeover. Was right. The struggle that, well, well, that is true, but then it was more or less a civil war. And then, of course, this goes back to another point is that in order to even have the, actually the conditions for, viol for armed struggle are actually much more strict in the sense that the central, the central governments you're dealing with, you're fighting against, has little ability to control the periphery of, of the country. You know, there'll be mountains and jungles where guerrillas can inform their base and hide. And in the modern world, you know, in this day and age, it just doesn't exist anymore. There's no, there's very, there are very few countries other than what we call failed states where that is still available. And this is why, you know, failed states actually could provide um, the breeding ground for terrorist groups these days. But of course, most, many of these failed states would not, by geography, necessarily seem to be ideal places for violence. They fail for other reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, Somalia is, is failed really because of its kind of social makeup, its, its division into little clans and tribes. And Syria has failed, um, failed, I suppose, because it had a, again, it, it, it had various tribes and sects and, and other groups and no sufficiently strong self-consciousness about being a national entity. The government was controlled by a small religious minority, and et cetera, et cetera. Same thing true in, in, in Iraq. Um, so there are situations, I mean, to, in order to, for nonviolence to be a success, you really have to have a government that's relatively effective, don't you, with which you can deal, that has interests that you can threaten. Uh, if you have a chaotic situation, there's really no one to talk to. Uh, no one to focus your energy. Would you kind of agree that that's the case? No, I would say that for in order to to even start a, an armed struggle, you have to have a relatively chaotic government that doesn't really basically has very little ability to police its own population and police its territory. Whereas nonviolent struggle, 
Again, there's really no guarantee because they've been successful. They've been actually very well organized nonviolent campaigns that haven't really worked. For example, the Palestinian First Intifada was a nonviolent campaign and lasted for several years and didn't work. It, to some extent, it is true that it kind of you know depends on what you do, but at the same time, also what regime you're dealing with. But on the other hand, what I also want to emphasize is that when you're dealing with particularly repressive re regime with the ability to police the population and police every inch of the territory, then you really have, and you you feel committed that you know the situation is intolerable and you want to fight for political ch change, then there's really no alternative that nonviolent struggle. Now, it's true that if you try to get organized, and you correct that in order for, in order for nonviolent movements to work, you need to have massive coordination. It works only if enough people, millions of people, all gather together to do something, or they even, or they actually don't have to, to gather together, but they all participate in a national boycott. They all do certain forms of non-cooperation at the same time in order to really have the impact. It really takes that much effort. But at the same time, it also you can also grow a, a small movement from you know it's just a team of of young dedicated people who are fearless and into a national movement before you get to that stage that you can be effective. And there are actually movements that have been like that, that every movement starts from somewhere. Even Gandhi's movement, it began with him and some loyal followers, and you try to then convince the rest of the population to follow you. I, I, I suppose in China itself, there would be an opportunity for nonviolence, uh, and yet it doesn't seem to be developing uh, on, the, on the national level. Um, you have the example of Hong Kong, maybe that was a negative example since it doesn't even work. Uh, but of course, there was the earlier Tenement Square, which was an attempt to put the government under nonviolent pressure. What, what, what's the situation in China now with respect to the possibilities of protest? Actually, you're quite right that China is a really hard case. But then at the same time, if we look at um, other cases, that they're not all easy cases either. I think going back to the, the anti apartheid movement in South Africa, uh, no one would say that the apartheid government regime was, was any less brutal than, for example, China today. It, so people had to begin by organizing underground, and in China this is very difficult. This is why very often we see that we say that in China you have daily protests by workers and and peasants and all kinds of uh, disadvantaged people, but at the same time they don't really coalesce because any time, so for, for example, workers of a particular factory, it is okay for them to go on strike, but if they cr go to the next factory or across the street to get other workers to to have a strike together, then they'll be arrested. I see. So. Individual, individualized protests are allowed it's in order to, I, I guess, allow the people to let off some steam, but collective action is really a no-go zone today. And of course, if non-violent if non um, uh, resistance has to be effective in the end, then it has to involve a lot of people, a lot of organizing. But at the same time, why the tenement movements didn't succeed and the umbrella movements didn't really succeed well, again, non not every form of non of non use of violence really can be effective. So in tenement, it's more or less the same idea. People gather at the tenement square. They didn't really know what else to do other than gathering at the tenement square to show this kind of you know the size of people power. A lot of people gather there. That makes for nice pictures. So tenement, you know, there are a lot of these nice pictures, very massive and moving pictures. Same with Hong Kong's umbrella movement. But beyond that. This disruptive form of action, just gathering at a public square, gathering at occupied sites, didn't really hurt the regime in order to compel the regime to do something differently. So eventually, you will just invite a crackdown. Or when you have this massive gathering of people, it's also very easy to invite bloodbath. Because you know, when you have a boycott, everyone stays home or stay away, everyone stays home. In Chile, they bang pots and pens. Who, who do you arrest? You know, people just banging pots and pens exactly at the same time. Every evening at 7 p.m., who do you go? Who do you go to arrest? But when you have this massive gathering of people all at the same square, okay, we know all the troublemakers are there. You surround the square, get rid of them. Tokyo Square in Egypt as well. It's the, actually it's the most ineffective form of, of movement. So you know you just arrest everyone or just kill off everyone at the square. 
more effective methods tend to be more dispersed so that it is very difficult to arrest them or to kill everyone. At the same time, they're also more sustainable. So nonviolence ha has some work in these cases. Sort of nonviolent guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Actually, people, people do argue that, um, that nonviolence is really not a form, a weapon of the weak. It is a weapon of the strong. And you have to be just as organized and strat and, and also with a full plan of strategy, just like fighting a real war. The only difference is that you fight with other means. So at all times, and well, throughout history, there have been a lot of factors that have shifted the balance of power between rulers and ruled. Uh, and of course, we live in an age in which there's a whole new way of communicating um, that didn't exist before. Folks argue on one side that this helps disperse power, and, and other folks will argue that it helps centralize power. Maybe different aspects help different people in different ways. Uh, social media has been very important uh, with respect to nonviolent protest. How did it work out? I mean, the Chinese are, Hong Kong especially, very well equipped electronically. How did that work for uh, nonviolent protest in the Ephraim? Did social media make a difference? Social media made a huge difference with this movement, and I guess this is why Beijing has to censor social media. But in Hong Kong, it is not censored. And so actually these days, I, I, ever since the Umbrella move, move, Movement started, I subscribe to all these different uh, Facebook feed sites, so now my major source of information, news, is actually, I check my Facebook all the time because also I can catch up with what is going on in Hong Kong. And definitely, it also facilitated what a lot of international journalists would call this kind of leaderless movement. People were very self-organized. A case on point, uh, many times at Occupy sites, certain supplies ran low. We were running out of masks, face masks. We were running out of um, water. And then they just had to basically post these messages on Facebook feeds. And within an hour, maybe, there will be scores of people, just ordinary mm -hmm. protesters, delivering the supplies that, pe that the, the occupiers were, were, were asking for. So social media met a great deal in terms of organizing people and mobilizing resources and making this movement so self-organized. But also another interesting thing is that in some cases where we social media then that makes, very, makes the situation a lot more difficult. Then you have to go, you have to kind of escape. How about the, uh, the Chinese outside of Hong Kong banned, uh, the authorities banned social media? What have they done? They, um, China has the, what they call the Great Firewall. So Facebook is banned, Twitter is banned, uh, basically all the major, so, and um, YouTube is banned. Mm -hmm. And before the, the umbrella movement, Instagram was allowed. But as soon as Hong Kong people post a lot of pictures of the protest sites, then even Instagram was also banned immediately, within hours actually. And the central authorities can just make it impossible for people to use these things, they cut them off from it. Right. Right, but essentially you have no access to, to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram unless you, you use VPN to scale the, the Great Firewall. But at the same time, the government has also made it increasingly difficult for people to use even VPN in the last two months. And um, so, for example, my Chinese students, because not today uses Gmail, mm -hmm. and Gmail is banned, and they've had serious trouble even getting using the, their emails while they go, when they were at home during the winter break. Now, we're told here in the United States that, um, you know, if you have a, an iPhone, um, potentially at least the, the government can track your movements, maybe can intercept your messages. Um, is, is that part of the balance of the Chinese government attempting to do that sort of thing? Earlier, there were even attempts that um, computers, laptops, would, be in, would have to install this software to track whatever people were doing. And there was this pushback. Yes, definitely. You know, this is why we, the people joke that if you, if, uh, the FBI is after you, make sure you, you throw away your cell phone. <laughs> even turning it off, it doesn't. <laughs> it's not enough. But I want to actually go back to an earlier question that you were talking about. This you said this idea of nonviolence, mm -hmm. non non cooperation, because the reason, and you talk, we're talking about is the um, shift in the balance between mm -hmm. the rulers and the rule. We have to, I think, go back to Gandhi's philosophy for why nonviolent resistance could be effective, at least potentially. It's because no single ruler, however ruthless, however capable, could rule by, rule by himself or herself, or usually himself. 
And the ruler, the dictator, will always have to move through this ruling coalition. Very often, you know, the ruling coalition is composed of security officers, military generals, um, secret police chief, and also business leaders. And in many cases, uh, even church leaders and educators, media leaders. So then this idea that, that you have this leader sitting at the top and they have pillars of support. Each pillar is the security forces, the church, educators, the education sector, the media. And the idea is that there's very little chance that you can really take down the dictator. You have no protesters, have no access to the guy at the top. You have also no access to the commander in chief or the minister, this is a minister of that. But what you could do then is to try to convince the people, the foot soldiers, that at the bottom of the state hierarchy, those people who actually then have regular contacts with the people, you try to pull them over. And this is why, at the same time, you pull them over, one, by convincing them. But sometimes it is also very difficult to do. This is why in a lot of the cases, then we're also talking about imposing costs. So the people would then think twice, you know, is it a good idea to continue to support the regime? Do I benefit more if I continue to support this regime, then I get all the business contracts? or I get to stay in power, I have access to all the purse. Or maybe, you know, I look at the size of the people power at, at the square, at Occupy size. These people, it's so massive that they eventually they are going to succeed. Maybe it is not better for me to switch side, and I can actually protect my interests a little better by protecting them. There's also the idea that um, something that again, Hong Kong people are not very aware of, you also have to want to, to, to win over the guys in uniform. Now, you can't really have access to the commander in chief or the police chief, but the foot soldiers, the individual policemen who are there, actually, who are the, the, the people who actually have to implement the police order, then can, can try to win them over. And this is why we also see pictures of people holding roses in front of these guards, with, um, basically who all look very solemn and, and very serious. But this is why we all often see pictures of women holding, and old women in particular, holding flowers and roses, what we call the Rose Revolution in Georgia, and in, also in Serbia. All these pictures. It's something that Hong Kong people haven't really done much. And the, with the confrontations between the police and protesters, relations have become so sour that it's, it's very difficult to really mend fences anymore. So that was tried. They were, they were in the beginning. There were some efforts, and also there are pictures of people. Really, for for example, because uh, this the symbol of umbrella. So Hong Kong rains a lot. There were pictures of protesters <laughs> holding umbrellas, sh um, sheltering <laughs> policemen, but not a lot. Now the relations are really bad. They're very sour. I think the very first instance of somebody putting a flower in a town was uh, where I spent my uh, ill-spent youth in Berkeley. Um, I, I can recall the many demonstrations that we had there. It was a flower power idea. So, so I gather that is uh, kind of spread around the world. Didn't succeed, I might say. <laughs> but um, so, are you are you optimistic about changing the world in a freer direction through the use of nonviolent protest? Do you think we'll see more and more of this throughout the world as time goes on? I think so, partly because people really have no choice if they're determined to fight for political change. Um, arm struggle just doesn't, is not very effective anymore. And, these, and then we also have seen that even people who originally start off with very good ideals, and they easily they can uh, outgun and ultimate power by the regime. And so repeatedly we've seen people having the temptation to then join forces with even terrorist organizations. So this is just not really working, and not to mention that there are not too many um, failed collapse days where where even staging a guerrilla base is even feasible. So for most cases, nonviolence is the only way out. Whether or not that is that is going to take you to immediate success, that's hard to say. But so long as people demand change, ultimately it really rests with how many people really want to want to have genuine freedom. If they are motivated to fight for freedom, then they'll resort to whatever methods that seem to, that would seem to work, and that ultimately will will change the tide. We also have to be patient. So Nelson Mandela's autobiography is long walk to freedom. It was a very long walk for him. We are talking about you know in the case of South Africa, almost an entire century. And Gandhi actually got his original idea of civil disobedience while he was in South Africa. Century long walk. 
So you 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 are you are optimistic. You see that long road ahead, but it is a road, and you think it leads in the right direction. In the long term, mm -hmm. there should be light at the end of the tunnel, but it it won't be easy. Nothing good in life comes easily. That's true. Well, thank you very much for spending time with us, and uh, we look forward to your lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you.